In 1 Timothy chapter 6, the last couple of verses of that first letter of Paul to Timothy, he ends that letter by saying, O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so called, which some professing have heard concerning the faith. Grace be with thee. Amen. Now, there's a multitude of lessons there, but the first part of verse 20 is what I'm concerned about and will set out the message I hope that we get today. O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust. Will you keep that in mind while I relate to you this little story? There was the mistress of a house who was very upset with her maid. And she was scolding her for being so slow. She accused her of being slow at ironing and cooking, cleaning the house, dusting and all that goes along with it. All the chores that she was assigned. And in her frustration, she finally asked the maid, Is there anything on earth that you do fast? And the maid said, yes, ma'am, I get tired fast. (laughs) And I wonder how many times that's been a problem in homes, individuals, in the church in particular. We have, I think, one of the longest lists, that is, the church does. One of the longest lists of starts. Starts. But yet, they're never finished. Have you ever noticed that about the church? Everybody, new program, new whatever you want to call it. And everybody's just, let's get with it. Well, at least most everybody. But how, how long does it last? So really we're talking about perseverance. Paul was concerned about that when he said to Timothy, O Timothy, keep that which you committed thy trust. Now that didn't mean, Timothy, you don't know a thing in the world about what I'm talking about. That means you know and you know your responsibility and you've got to keep on keeping on. Don't we use that terminology sometimes? And we're very much mindful of a verse I quote most often. And that is the last verse of 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye unmovable and abounding and all that. Well, what is he saying? Stay with it. Put your heart into it. Never get tired of doing what's right. But we do. Nevertheless, that's what this is about. We are admonished to persevere. Persevere is a good word. Do you know of anybody that accomplishes much of anything worthwhile that doesn't have the disposition of heart that would be described as perseverance. In Galatians 6 and verse 9, Paul wrote and said, And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. If we don't fall out, you keep on going. You know, one of the interesting things about being trained as a soldier, marine or a sailor, When the bullets are flying and men are dying and everything's in uproar, then they're trained to keep on doing what they're supposed to do. And if people fall by the wayside, you holler a medic, a corpsman, or something like that, and you keep on keeping on. When I was in the band back in high school, I think that was the day after Columbus discovered America. (laughs) Seems like, although to me it seems like yesterday sometimes. We had a band director who was very stern. He was very military. And when that came to marching, uh, he was like a sergeant. <laughs> I never will forget, I started in the fifth grade, and he was the band director, and, and he was somebody that really put you through the ropes on learning how to march. But one time after we got up to senior high, and you always start in August, you know, before school started, because you got to get down and memorize the songs you're going to use in... Uh, 
halftime and all that kind of stuff, and you have to get yourself used to marching again and doing all this stuff. And so he told some of us, because he kept telling us, you keep on doing what you're supposed to do no matter what happens around you. Well, you know a bunch of teenagers. Isn't it? That's kind of hard to do sometimes. One falls out, everybody wants to fall out. <laughs> so he would have us march in, and we'd march through the streets of the community. And we'd be marching down through there, and he would already have designated somebody, though only known to him and the person, to just fall out in the ditch there in the neighborhood to see what anybody else would do. And he got us to the point to where they just fell out in the ditch and we kept going. <laughs> Don't get in the way, we'll step on you. Anybody knows that plays, um, plays percussion that you play all the time that you're marching. The band's not playing a, a song, you're playing cadence, so you never stop playing if you're moving. So we just kept beating the cadence right along and the whole of the band kept doing what it was supposed to do even though somebody fell out. Well, it seemed to be important and armies doing what armies are supposed to do under terrible circumstances. Seems to be important about anything I know of and can you think of anything that does not demand perseverance? Staying with it. And usually staying with it when it's not easy to stay with. In fact, when it hurts to stay with it. And I think in this nation today and in our homes, we're not teaching that too much to people. It's sort of, you do it if it feels good and if it's not too hard. And the first time you hit a bump in the road, you sit down. Now, I'm not saying everybody's that way. If everybody was that way, nothing would function very well. But I see it in the homes between husbands and wives. I see it when it comes to children as to them being held accountable for anything or being trained and taught to learn. You know, folks, we're training our children to leave us. And to be mature and responsible in establishing their own homes. That's just what all it comes to. And that takes perseverance on their part, and it's a learned thing, and it needs to be able to be seen in the parents. Well, when you've got hit or miss parents and about anything, what do you think that's going to say to the children? If you don't show them, let's say regarding the church, concerning Bible study, concerning worship, concerning other works that the church does collectively, if you don't show them in obedience to Matthew 6.33 that this comes first, where are they going to learn it? And who did God put here to teach and to train them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord? If they're only going to attend uh, the services when you're with them to make them be there, and as soon as you're not around, they're headed off out to what they really want to do in the first place, what have you accomplished? Now, I say all of that fully realizing that each one of us are free moral agents. You can fall out of love with the Lord. I've seen too many people over 50 years, even preachers, who just completely uh, gave up. Not just stopping to preach, but stopping living Christian lives. In fact, I, if I had known about a lot of that stuff just as a young preacher, it would have been a very great disappointment to me. But, of course, the Lord in His infinite wisdom sort of introduces you to those bad things as you move along gradually. And as you've grown faithfully, you can not let those things be stumbling blocks to you. So one of the greatest things you can do in your exemplary conduct in your family, in the church, to your neighbors, is to persevere. You're not going to give up. Through thick and thin, you're going to be what you know the Bible says you ought to be. Sometimes uh, I doubt we ever know the impact we have on neighbors just because they know where we are when it comes to Sunday morning, Sunday afternoon, or in some cases Sunday night, Wednesday night, or other things. They know. And it's kind of encouraging sometimes, like when not long ago, it's been a few, several months ago, in fact, our car was there during worship right after we switched. Of course, this goes back a few years ago now, doesn't it? To afternoon. So the neighbor who doesn't go anywhere saw that we were there and called over the house to see what was wrong. 
Well, I thought a lot about that when that happened. I said, you don't ever know when you are impacting somebody else. You just don't know. No man is an island to himself. None of us are. And probably we're impacting more people by our conduct to, when we don't know it than we do when we know it. But don't underestimate, Mom and Daddy, what you are doing for your children when you show forth the desire to do what God said do no matter what. Twice in the fourth chapter of 2 Corinthians, Paul makes this statement. And think of all Paul went through for the cause of Christ. It would have been easy to quit. He says, we faint not. We don't quit. We are not quitters in doing what God requires of us. And specifically as an apostle of Christ, what he had to do that nobody else could do. In this chapter, we're given a look at uh, their circumstances, 2 Corinthians 4. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed. I think I've spent a lot of my time being perplexed. There's a lot of being perplexed at brethren. But not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. 2 Corinthians 4, 8 through 9. Don't you think that pretty much describes a faithful child of God in any time in this earth's history? Things upset you. Things hurt you. And it's because you're living like the Bible said. But because you know it's God's word and this is the way from earth to heaven, you don't quit. You, you go to work and you're going to have things that trouble you, that perplex you. You may even be persecuted. There may be even people that forsake you. But you stay with that job if you can at all. Not that you wouldn't take another one that would be better. That's not the point. When it comes to the Christian life, there is no better. When it comes to going from earth to heaven, there's no other way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth of the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me, John 14, 6. The proof of your love of God is keeping his commandments. There is no other true proof of your love of God. Jesus said to the apostles concerning the great work that they had to do in John 14, 15, if you love me, King James says, keep my commandments. American Standard says, you will keep my commandments. Now, there's no other way I can demonstrate to God that I love him with all that I am and all that I have, except by keeping his commandments. Just no other way. And loving my neighbor is myself, which means my neighbor is anybody in need. And the whole world's in need of the gospel. And we're charged as the church, the spiritual body of Christ, and members in particular, to, to the best of our ability, to to be ready to preach the gospel to everybody. The church at Smyrna was instructed, be thou faithful unto death, in order to death. If being faithful means you must die physically, then be faithful and die. Now what's the reward? And I will, this is Jesus speaking, I will give you a crown of life, Revelation 2.10. Now that's just too much for a lot of people to bear, and so they don't persevere, they don't stay with it. They're not steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. It's become too hard for them. It's dreary. It's not easy. It's not fun. You ever hear your children when you want them to do something? And they, well, Mom, that's not fun. That's not fun. There's a whole lot about Christianity. There's a whole lot about doing right because it is right and simply because we ought to do right. That's not pleasant and fun and lighthearted. A lot of obligations just are hard to do. And we recognize that usually in other phases of life. All of you who have been to school, high school, junior college, community college, graduate degrees, whatever it is, did everything you take, was it pleasant and wonderful? And you enjoyed it? You just looked forward to doing it? Well, you went to... Different schools than what I went to, and I went to about five or six. There's a lot of things. I'm still trying to figure out on my educational degrees what some of those curses, uh, and maybe that's what they were, curses. They sure felt like it sometimes. What those courses really contributed to anything. I'm still trying to figure that out. And when I remember back on them as best I do, I don't know. 
I guess somebody that was a professional educator thought that you needed whatever that course was supposed to cover. But I never figured it out. And that didn't mean I didn't make a good grade. That wasn't too hard in some of them. The modern idea of this verse, Revelation 2.10, is not that you believe and you persevere even if it causes you your death, you don't quit doing what the Lord said. But it's the idea of, well, I just have a good job. I'm making it fine. I, I'm living the Christian life. I attend all the services and the gospel meetings and so forth. And I gradually get old and after, you know, 85 or 90, I die. That's not what Revelation 2.10 means. Those people understood it because they were actually having to suffer because they practiced what we freely do. They had to stick with it. The modern idea then is not the idea of the ancients. When the ancients who first heard this under, uh, understood it, uh, they understood it to mean keep on believing, even if believing means you must die. In Ephesians 6.18, Paul urges perseverance. And according to uh, Thayer's Greek lexicon of the New Testament, this means, and you, we've already seen it, but nevertheless perseverance, continue steadfastly. In, uh, to give constant attention to a thing. Notice, constant attention to a thing. To be steadfastly attentive unto. To give unremitting care to a thing. Now, you know, this is a general study of the Bible covering all of Christian living. But let's get particular with it. What does that mean for me as a preacher of the gospel? Let's read it again. Thayer says of the Greek concerning the meaning of perseverance, continue steadfastly to give constant attention to a thing, to be steadfastly attentive unto, to give unremitting care to a thing. Well, it means, first of all, that I've got to live the same life any godly person does. And it means then I've got to study and learn because I can't teach what I don't know. <laughs> and it means I've got to follow, and this is true of any gospel preacher if they're faithful, it means I've got to follow the way the New Testament lays it out when it comes to preaching the gospel of Christ. And of course we have 1st, 2nd Timothy and Titus that were written to young preachers and you have much in there. It has to do with what a preacher is supposed to do. I'm not supposed to preach and no other preacher is like some people think I'm supposed to preach. I'm supposed to preach like the Bible says I'm supposed to preach. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. That means give them the truth when people are clamoring over themselves, hungry and thirsting after it. But it means also give them the truth and they don't want it and they're going to stone you for it like Stephen did. I don't have a choice in the matter. When, if I'm going to be a gospel preacher, I preach all that the truth covers regarding spiritual things. Now that covers a multiplicity of topics. We can't go into it now and you know that. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort. Now there's a three-part sermon. <laughs> Reprove, rebuke, and exhort. Two of them are pretty negative, aren't they? It means dealing with the sins of people. What did we say this morning in beginning this study of Genesis, which we already know, that is an auditorium, that the Bible really is dealing with the sin problem in your life and my life because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23, and the wages of sin is death, separation from God, Romans 6, 23. <clears throat> now, when you preach the word, you're sounding out the only thing in the world that can save a person from, from sin. The terms of pardon in the word of God that has to do with how a person gains remission of sins. And it's all dependent upon understanding God's will. It's not a matter of what I want. So a preacher's got to preach the word on whatever it is that governs spiritual and moral matters. He's got to give it to people when they want it and when they despise it. But he doesn't change the message. <clears throat> and then also reprove, rebuke, and exhort. With all long suffering, you bear with people as you'd want God to bear with you. Doesn't mean compromise. I think long suffering in some people's mind is compromise the truth. No, it doesn't mean that. It means you keep saying the truth in every way you know how to say the same truth because it's the truth that makes us free. And you give people time, just like God gives us all time, 
to understand the truth, the gospel, the power of God to save us, to submit to it. You don't compromise anything, but you keep teaching the truth and you keep living the truth. With all long suffering and doctrine, they both go together. The and, the conjunction, says it's long suffering and doctrine. Doctrine and long suffering. Where one goes, the other goes. So you keep bearing with it. Just like God. If I want to know what long suffering means, then think about what God is doing for the whole world right now. 2 Peter 3 and verse 9 as to the Lord's coming back. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but all should come to the truth. <coughs> so that's the way I've got to be. If I'm going to be a faithful gospel preacher, I can't be what somebody else thinks I ought to be. Now, I'm not making this personal. I'm saying this is true of any gospel preacher. Okay, that's the gospel preacher. He fits into the organization of the Lord's church. But there are the elders. You think elders ever get tired of being elders? You think I ever get tired of being a preacher? What if I were to stand here and tell you, I have never been tired of preaching the gospel at all. Never. What's going on in your mind right now if you thought I was actually stay, saying that? Biggest liar? Or be running for president? <laughs> Either party. <laughs> Any direction you want to go. <laughs> it doesn't make much difference. I'll be a politician. That would, just wouldn't be true. People get tired of doing good things, right things, God's will. But you see, perseverance says... When you're wore out and beat down in doing the right thing, you get on up and you drag through it again. Not because you don't want to, but because you know it's right and it's good and it's wholesome and God has never laid anything on us in His Word that's not for our good to take us on to heaven. There's not a word in the Bible that's against man. Not a word. Every word in the Bible understood in this context is designed to get me from earth to heaven. And when we're studying it, we ought to think about that. So elders get tired. Everybody knows elders are flawless. They never sin. They never make mistakes. Everybody knows that. They're not qualified to be an elder unless they get in that position. And what they lack, their wives make up anyway because they go home and discuss everything in the church about whatever it is and get their approval of it before they make a decision. Everybody knows that happens. You know, my daddy was an elder for 30-something years. And they were having a problem one time, and daddy was having to stay in an uncalled meeting. <coughs> And mother was standing and waiting. Preachers, wives, and elders have a great assignment many times to stand and wait. And they learn after a while, it's going to be a long time we sit down and go where it's cool and visit. <laughs> but the people were still standing around. And it was known in the church what it was about. Mother was standing there. She related this later. One of the members came up and began to talk to her like she knew all about what was going on. And got through, he left. You know, people like that always leave you an open. I've told you everything about it. Give me the rest. And when he got to that point, she says, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> and she didn't. It went into her business. But members assume that that's right. You know if an elder and a preacher, by the way, really care for their wives and love them like the Bible says men ought to love their wives, they don't tell them things that they don't have to know. It saves them a lot of problems. Because after all, they're not Ms. Elder. Let me tell you something. If you're thinking about being an elder and you have that view, you're not qualified to be an elder. And if you are wanting to be an elder and your wife has that view, you're still not qualified to be an elder. I've seen situations where an elder's come home from an elders meeting, <clears throat> what do you call it when, uh, when you've been in the military and you go out on a mission and you come back from the mission, they debrief you? And that's exactly what happened among some wives when their husbands came home to the elders meeting. Believe it or not, I've seen situations where when they found out decisions made that didn't suit her the next meeting, Though he had agreed to whatever it was in the first meeting, now that he got his uh, marching orders and after being properly debriefed, he found out he didn't really agree with that in the first place, and so he took another stand. Not qualified to be an elder. 
Stay in that position, you're going to lose their soul just as much as a person ever obeys the gospel. Elders have a lot of things to do in the, in the shepherding of the flock. They have to deal with every member. Let me ask you this. Now, I want you to think about this, some of you who would be elders. I don't know who you might be as a man. Would you, uh, would you like to have the charge of managing each and every one of you as a shepherd does a sheep? Would you like that? You see, that's the reason elders are to know the members, but have you ever noticed in that, that's not where it ends. The members are to know the elders. I've heard some nice prayers, and I, I appreciate them from various ones of you praying for the elders that we not be a burden to them. Let me ask you a question. Are you a burden to the elders in shepherding this flock to keep it like the Bible says? Well, perseverance must be in the eldership to keep on doing what's right no matter what the situation is. You will, you will never be faithful as a preacher of the gospel, as an elder, or anything else in life that God enjoins upon us to do. If you don't have, I will stick to this till the bitter end. I'm not going to run. In secular things, men die for this world. Would you have stayed at the Alamo? Would you? What was it, 180-something people? Several thousand Mexicans outside? And you're in there? And the people that said they were coming aren't coming? They weren't many anyway. And then they blow that little tune that says, You're dead. It won't do you any good to surrender. When we come, you're dead. It's called cutthroat, by the way. It's a common term. Would you have stayed? Well, those folks didn't stay because they were serving God as such, as we in the church, the army of the Lord do. They, 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 they stayed for a secular thing that ended right there. It had nothing to do with going to heaven. It had to do with going to Texas <laughs> and building it in rebellion to Santa Ana and all that. I don't know that we think of them. You know, this doesn't take Greek and Hebrew knowledge from some big university. It just is a looking into your heart and honesty in the light of the truth. Will I stick with it? Will I persevere? How do you develop into anything if you don't stick with it that's worthwhile? So, continue steadfastly to give constant attention to a thing, to be steadfastly attentive unto, to give unremitting care to a thing. We'll put that in context of your life. What about the head of a house, a husband? Can he be what the New Testament says he ought to be and not persevere? What about the wife and her role in running the house under the headship of the husband? Can she be what she ought to be as a wife and a mother and not stay with it? Does it ever, let me ask you this, you, with, you mothers that have had children for a few years. You ever get tired? You ever get tired dealing with children? Well, that means you don't love them, doesn't it? That you don't care a thing about them. You're ready to kick them out the window. Well, you may be able to kick them out the window and still love them. My mother used to say, if y'all going to start all that in the house, get outside. And she'd drive us outside. I don't know that even happens anymore. Don't slam that screen door. And we get outside, she hooked it. And there we were outside. But she wasn't going to have us, as she said, rough housing in the house. And that meant mama didn't love us. <laughs> What I'm saying is, persevering means you go through all sorts of things, and even though you get tired of its right, you don't quit. You don't quit. So that's the reason I say this is a general principle of Christian living, but it's also of just living in life and accomplishing anything. Edison, in developing the light bulb, had all these failures. And I asked him about it one time, you've heard this. He said, no, it wasn't a matter of a failure. He learned that didn't work, so he went to something else. Finally got a light bulb, but it was perseverance. It was perseverance. Following the establishment of the Lord's church, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and breaking of bread and in prayers, Acts 2.42. And you'll remember that an earnest, uh, earnest effort was made to stop the spread of Christianity 
in several ways. You can be sure the devil turned loose everything he had control of to stop the infant church. Sometimes we don't realize that, that if God had not given the miraculous powers to the apostles and the miraculous gifts that existed through the apostles' hands being laid upon members to thwart all that the devil threw at them, I don't know what would happen. I'm always amazed at reading what Paul went through and how he was able to do it on and on and on every time. It was because God was with him in a special way to get the church established. But once the church was established and into the world, then the New Testament was fully given and thus it's left to us now to keep on keeping on. And they tried to stop the mouths of the preachers. First of all, they tried by commanding them not to do it anymore, by beating them. But the response was perseverance. We ought to obey God rather than men, Acts 5.29. That's perseverance. And they kept on with the preaching. They began to stone Christians to death. Other things too than Paul tells that he did himself as Saul of Tarsus, persecutor of the church. He says they entered into every house and they committed men and women to prison. Yet the scripture reads, as Luke by inspiration records in Acts 8 and verse 4, therefore they went, when they were scattered abroad, they went everywhere preaching the word. What conviction, what love of the truth, what reality, this is the only way to heaven, and we can't let anybody stop us. Perseverance. There was just no way to keep them from continuing steadfastly. Perhaps one of the biggest failings of the Lord's church today is the lack of staying power. Someone's described the service of some congregations being rather malarial. Fever, then chill. Fever, then chill. Fever, then chill. Not steadfast every day doing what you could, growing in greater knowledge and staying with it. And thus you have to ask yourself the question, if I died right now and I'm gone, will the church here miss me? Not in the sense of miss my face and my voice and my presence, but would it miss me in the contribution would it miss me in the teaching program? Would it miss me in whatever it is that Christians are to do to help each other be better and to, to reach the community? This is obviously true as the cold and the hot of the people. But any new effort a church tries, it usually goes with a flare and then it burns out rather quickly. And it can happen with any preacher, with any elder, with any deacon, with any Bible class teacher. I'm just too tired. Well, fine, you're tired, so recreate and get back with it. Why do I think I can quit working for the Lord when I'm still alive and able to do so on this earth? Why? Where did I learn that? Where did the Bible teach you that was the way to do? Perseverance. Well, what can I do but say nothing in the world can take the place of persistence? Talent will not. Nothing's more common than unsuccess, unsuccessful men with talent. Genius will not. Unrewarded genius is almost a proverb. Education will not. The world's full of educated derelicts. The slogan, press on, has solved and always will solve the problems of the human race when the pressing has to do with what God says we ought to press. It's just always that way. We can't quit till heaven's our home. We may have to slow up. We may not be able to do it like we once did. But isn't that true of everything else? And I hate to say some of the young people, someday you're going to be as old as somebody. <laughs> some of us. Now, will you be faithful when you get there? Or will you have already quit? Have you ever wondered about Demas? And then we'll stop on this. Demas didn't persevere. He's mentioned a couple of times with Paul, as Paul writes about him. But then Paul has to write and say, Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. And we think, well, he must have gone back into idolatry. He must have just given up the church. Well, he may have. To follow Paul around... That's pretty tough business. But you know, I'm not so sure that he went completely away from the faith. He may have just decided, I think I'll be one of those that shows up and worship all the time in Bible class. But I am not going to get people in such a state they want to chop my head off. 
I can't put up with that anymore. You know, I'm just too nervous. I can't put up that anymore. Again, problems can come along physically and mentally, and you have to stop doing what you did in the past. Nobody's talking about that. That has nothing to do with this sermon. Perseverance means I'm in control of myself. I know what's right, and I'm not going to quit. Well, there are certain people who get mental states where they don't know whether they're coming or going or upside down or wrong side out. I'm not talking about people like that. I'm talking about people who could and won't, who could and did for a while and then resigned. I don't want to be found in that position when my Lord comes back. So whether it's preachers, elders, deacons, Bible school teachers, husbands, wives, mothers, daddies, you stay with what you know God wants you to do to the best of your ability as long as you're on this earth. Now, ask yourself the question, is that really asking too much? When you think of what Christ did for us, to save us from sin. Perseverance. If you're not a Christian, then today is the time to become one because that's all you have. You have right now to act upon the truth. Well, I may have tomorrow. You don't have tomorrow. You have right now to do what you know your God said for you to do and to resolve in your heart to live for Him no matter what the rest of your life. To believe that Christ is the Son of God, repent of your sins, confess your faith in Him as the Son of God, and be baptized in water for the remission of your sins by His authority. Now, the next part of this touches on those who are members of the church, and that's most everybody here. Would you describe your life to this point as being a life that perseveres? That puts into practice being steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord? Now, if there are things secret known only to you and God in your life, then it's handicapping you, then fine, take care of that. But if your life is set an example before the brethren of the world that you're just hit or miss, sometimes hot or cold, you think that's a good pattern for everybody to follow? And to make it even more pointed, is that the way you want your dear children to live? When it's convenient, we'll do it. If it's not, we won't. That's pretty much America's theme in a lot of things. But you will not go to heaven with that idea. Heaven is the home of those who want to go and who understand the way to go and who persevere and are steadfast and will not stop doing what God says is right. Now, do you need to repent of those sins? If you do, now is the time to do it and let the words move you to do it. Think of the words of the song that encourage you and resolve to stick with it and not quit. Are you subject to the invitation of our Lord? If so, please come to him while we stand and sing.